Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show. It's me, Steven. And of course, I'm here again with my two co-host buddies. First and foremost, Bala. How's it going, man? Hey, Steven. How are you doing? It's been a while. I met you both you plus. I think the last we met during the KLJDT. Yes, yes. And then a lot of, a lot of things have happened. And uh, here, we, here we go again. MCO 3.1, I guess. Uh, Elvin, is it correct? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's 3.0. But you know, the sad part is, uh, you know... When we were just about to start to get things rolling, you know, go to the stadium, start to record stuff and all that, then we're all back at home again, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that's quite devastating, you know. And also, you know, another devastating day lah today for me. Mm, okay, I think maybe we'll come to that a little bit later, okay? I'm yeah. sure everybody yeah. wants to know. <laughs> all right? Yeah. But, you know... And not uh, just me anyway. Yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, uh, for this episode, of course, you know, we have a, a, a guest in our show. And you and you probably might have uh, heard from him before on the Bola Bola show when we did an uh, Inter Milan special sometime last year. If I'm not mistaken, maybe, I guess maybe it was about a year ago we did that episode. Anyway, yeah. uh, welcoming back to the Bola Bola show is none other than Ras, all the way from Singapore, from Backpass with Ras. Hello, hello, guys. It's, it's a pleasure. Having you back, sorry, um, having myself back on your show. Mm-hmm. And anyways, um, for my listeners listening in, because we're sharing this on Backpass with Russ, this is our first ever collaborative show with the inspiration behind our show, the guys at the Bola Bola show. Mm. So um, I'll just introduce you guys to the three Argentine gauchos from Clang, <laughs> Elvin, Elvin, and Bala. These are the inspiration behind the Back Pass with Ras show. Yep, yep. And, and to be honest, yes, I, I've enjoyed many of your episodes. Uh, wonderful contents as well. So yes, please do check out the Back Pass with Ras. But I guess it's only appropriate that, you know, Ras, maybe you want to share with our listeners exactly, you know, what's the concept of your podcast, by the way? Well, the concept of the podcast is actually we're just bringing you back down memory lane, going back to the 90s and 2000s, uh, looking back at football at that time. It's quite thematic in that sense that we have a, maybe a certain episode will focus on a certain team or national team or a period in that time or some, you know, like our first ever episode was on playmakers. So, you know, it's thematic and at certain episodes like the last one we had, was with Shabby Singh and it was also thanks to you guys that there was this collaboration uh, between us that allowed for that episode to be uh, recorded and released to public. So that was uh, our first ever interview episode. This is our first ever collaborative episode. So yeah, we're breaking boundaries here. Yes, yes, true indeed. And that fact that you mentioned the 90s and this episode is all about the 90s, specifically with the European Championship. As you guys know, that they, you know, we were supposed to have the Euro last year, but because of the pandemic, it has been postponed and brought forward to this year. It's an exciting tournament coming ahead, and we're going to get down right away. First, with Euro 92, right after this message. Denmark's dream has become reality. A quite astonishing achievement. The rank outsiders who didn't even qualify have become the champions of Europe undisputed they are the 1992 european champions it is simply a footballing fairy tale so guys you know uh, we are now back in 1992 right so for for us all you know kids who are born in the 80s you know is this the first ever euro for kids around our age guys like like i mean maybe you can share with us or share with me your experiences like like you know what, 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 what do you go through at this time, this point of time? Mm. Start with you. Yeah, Russ. Maybe Russ wants to go first. Yeah, let's okay, get Russ sure, done. sure. Yeah, I'll go yeah, first. Guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm family, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyways, actually it was my first Euro, but it was not really the first one that I watched because at that point I was about eight years old mm-hmm. and I had no clue at all of this tournament and the 
and the existence of the European Championships because all I knew was of the World Cup. I didn't know about European Championships until until one day when I open up the newspaper and on the eve of the tournament in the mm-hmm. newspaper I was looking through in the sports section and saw this tournament European Championships and then I was looking at all the teams participating and I was looking out for my favorite team Italy and I was thinking hey how come Italy is not here so I just couldn't understand it and I asked my father about it and you know why they weren't there he just told me they were not playing so he didn't really give me the backdrop on that you need to qualify for this tournament and all that so mm-hmm. that's probably where my interest started and ended for that euros because you know italy were not in it but you know i was still keeping an eye on the tournament and i was uh, you know taking a look at the squads as well because some of the players i could recognize from serie a and from the english premier league or in those days it was the english first division so i could recognize some of the players and some of the teams i knew as well from the world cup and also yeah that that's my experience with euro 92 the start of it mm, and 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 what about you bala well me uh, was i was just under i think you we, we were at the under 6 uh, 12 years old to be as that yeah that that, that dreaded upsr eh? yeah now we're in obsolete for for, for whatever reason <laughs> yeah Well, that time uh, UPS are known to be, uh, you know, uh, in Indian we call it mana personnel. You know, every, every fella, every fella, you know, will call you. It was was something different. But then uh, coming back to Europe, whereby uh, I wasn't much into football at that time. I just used to read newspapers and uh, that kind of information. But to be fully involved, I wasn't there yet until uh, World Cup in 1994. So it's more like you know reading newspaper. I'm more into slang all the time, and of course until now. But this was just a touch and go kind of thing. How about you, uh, Sivan? Well, you know, my, my story is similar to Russ because it's just basically uh, the tournament just took me by surprise. I, I just happened to, uh, I think I went to play football in the evening, came back home and my dad just came back from work. So he had his star newspaper. I'm sure, Elwin, you remember back in those days, you know, when you have these tournaments. Yes, the, the bumper the middle, pull out. Yes, the bumper pull out, the middle section, yeah. you have yeah. it uh, big spread out with all the matches. Uh, awesome. You can fill in yep. the score, yep. you know, the tables and all yes. that. So that's, yes. that's when I knew, okay, you know, we're having Euro 92. Uh, and thank goodness it was on the same night with the opening fixture between France and Sweden. So that's pretty much how I got started with Euro competition. Although during the 1990 World Cup, I did sort of uh, remember reading something about what happened in 88. But, you know, I... Totally couldn't remember or didn't watch any game from that particular edition. Yeah, so 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 you know people probably all the younger generation be wondering why why was it so hard for us to get information right? This was definitely before the pre Google days and all that yeah. lah. So it was really yeah, yeah. very very it's like we rely on newspaper and the kind of media that comes in. Also, it's like you know. Usually very late and uh, almost very close to tournament starting, so we don't really have much information there. But I don't know about you guys, but for me, especially during this period, uh, like the 1990 World Cup and the uh, Euro '92 and all that, uh, I, I I had to go to because of the European time zone, right? So I, you know, I had to go do do this thing of you know sneaking out of my room quietly. Same, same here, same here. Putting, <laughs> putting the TV on mute, you know, completely no volume, bro. Just totally, completely no volume at all. Just watching the games, <laughs> hiding in the dark and watching the games because you don't want to wake up your parents, right, in the middle of the night when you have to go to school the next day. Yeah. So yeah. this this is something you know, uh, you know, I I really take on lah. Like, I really remember lah like, during during this this period lah. Like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I remember the I got a, a memory now of that you know the newspaper pull out of the fixtures the league uh, the round robin tables and all that we used to have that as well I used to collect it for each tournament so whether it was Euros or World Cup and and, and I would diligently fill it up you know as the tournament go by yes yes yeah. yes indeed yeah, yeah. okay So you know, I think one of the most significant thing about the Euro '92 was that for the first time ever, Germany came as a unified nation. Uh, just a bit of history, uh, you know, in the uh, prior to the '90s, uh, for I think about 30, 40 years, Germany was split between East and West. Then in 1989, as the Berlin Wall came down, they became a unified nation. So you know, voila, I suppose you know expectation must be very high, and not forget the fact that Germany are also the World Cup holder, right? Yes, even I think the the, the spirit and the, all this uh, with the communism, whereby the Russia was there, yeah, the Russian most likely coming to the east east side, and then this Western coming to West Germany, 
and Germany won the World Cup. I think the unification made all sense after my especially going to the first tournament as a World Cup uh, holders. And uh, on top of that, I think there's even another uh, uh, historical event was happening concurrently on the other side of the Europe, whereby USSR was dismantled and it became CIS, uh, the, uh, what the common man of independent states. And prior to that, USSR knocked out uh, Ras Italy from that uh, Euros as well. And don't forget that Italy is, uh, the team is quite a detailed team with the Mancini striker, Baggio was there, uh, Maldini was there, even Giava, Pajlukia with Walter Zenga was playing. And then it was a solid team actually. So. Uh, two events, one is unification, another one dismantling. So it was really uh, some kind of euro to look into for, for that era, actually, Ras. Mm, okay, okay. So, of course, you know, Ras, unfortunately, Italy didn't qualify. But, uh, yeah. we, but we had France and England, two, I would say, you, you, uh, traditionally European powerhouse. But surprisingly, neither made it past the group stage, man. Yeah, true. I think going into the tournament, they were both uh, among the two teams that I was familiar with because uh, France had Cantona. He was playing for Leeds and John Pierre Papan. Um, England, of course, you know, recognize the players from the English First Division. Not many Manchester United players in that squad, but you still could recognize the players. And I say they were favorites along with uh, Holland and Germany to win the tournament. Um, I think in a nutshell, those two teams, France and England, they drew two matches and surprisingly lost the last crucial match against Scandinavian opponents, uh, Denmark and Sweden, and they were knocked out. So from my understanding, and this is why I read, um, is that France's team and that tournament was not united. They were going into the tournament full of confidence because I think they were on a long unbeaten run. But they were just not united and in that tournament, they suddenly were you know, playing defensively, which is unlike the style of their manager, Michel Platini, and that didn't suit the team and there was you know, some unhappiness in that camp, so that's probably why France didn't get through. Well, And for England, this was the start of their disastrous spell under Graham Taylor mm-hmm. and uh, this team had a lot of uh, injuries as well going into this tournament and the performance in this tournament was an indication of things to come in the years ahead for England. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. I mean, this was a totally different time for both uh, England and France, unlike mm-hmm. what we have seen in the years to come after that. So another significant thing about Euro 92 is undoubtedly one of the greatest striker of that time. Of course, you know, every time I hear people talk about him, there's no question he's gifted, remarkably gifted player and one of the best of his generation, Marco Van Basten. The last time, of him outing on the international stage. I mean, what what a great player was he, Alvin? Yeah, I mean, uh, indeed, what what a legend he was in that era, right? So, so can you can you guys just imagine, right? You know, uh, Berus Cloney only signed him for one million pounds, you know, wow. for AC Milan from AX, okay? And and with that kind of bargain, and at that time, his goal ratio in AX. Uh, in over 130 games, was almost one goal a game. Okay, so so you can imagine for that kind of talent at that time, you know, one million pounds. Okay, and then of course, you know, he was definitely part of that immortal AC Milan team. You know, in the late 80s and early 90s, and uh, you know, in fact, uh, he was he won three Ballon d'Ors in uh, 80, 88, 89, and 92. And the, basically, that that Milan team was just superb. So he was basically you know, alongside uh, Rijkaard and uh, Gullit as well. And in fact, uh, if, if, if you guys remember, um, Euro 92, okay, was really sub... I, I would say it, it was a forgettable experience for Marco Van Basten. You know, even though his last tournament and all that, you know, uh, there was no goals from him and uh, he had that penalty miss, you know, in that loss to Denmark in the mm-hmm. semis, right? And uh, But if, if we go back just four years before that and that fantastic Wally. You know, in that mm, final against exactly. Soviet Union, that yep. that that is, I think, to me, you know, one of the goals of the Euro tournaments. Like even until now, even when you look at it, when you look at it, you'll be wondering, wow, you know, that that goal really sums up Marco Van Basten totality, Yeah. But Marco Van Basten again was quite young still. Right? Yes, correct, Bala, because uh, you know when he re- he had he was basically forced to retire at the age of twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. Ankle injury, yeah, it, it was an irreversible ankle injury. So the poor guy, you know, he actually had so many more years ahead of him, but because he couldn't, he couldn't do much about that injury, his career ended at the tender age of just twenty-eight. 
Yeah, so so what what a loss for the world of football. But what you know what memories he has given us. Even though you know Euro '92, not much there. But I would say you know a true legend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I remember Marco and Baston as well. Um, you know, listening to um highlights or rather news, they would always be talking of, about Serie A uh, scores from Serie A and all that. And AC Milan was be featured quite heavily and. Every now and then you hear Marco and Bastian score a hat trick. Marco and Bastian got a hat trick. So that stuck in my mind on the kind of striker he was. Was fearsome. And then suddenly one day he he retired. I was like, wow, that's early. Mm, so yeah, I remember Marco and Bastian uh, from those years in Serie A. Okay. Yep. And of course, you know, yep. Euro '92. It it to sum up uh, in overall, it seems to have one of the best ever storyline in the history of the competition. As you just mentioned, Elwin, you know that uh, Denmark and uh, Netherlands in that semi-final. I mean, at that stage in time, did any one of you guys had any idea that what Denmark is going to pull in this in this competition, or you just felt that maybe it's going to be a typical, you know, Germany Netherlands final? I mean, what, what, what's your guys' take on this? I think as a neutral, it was fantastic to follow, and uh, it was the triumph of the underdog. So outside of Peter Schmeichel, I didn't know much of the Danish team at that time. But it was wonderful to see when they beat Holland. I thought, okay, they beat Holland, went to the final. Okay, this is maybe a step too far. But then they went on and beat Germany. I thought it was wow, fantastic. I think that was probably the first ever underdog victory in my time as a football fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a, a total, total underdog victory. Yeah, I mean, completely unexpected, you know. And uh, it, it, I mean, to me, there, there, there are two things here, lah. Okay, so, so if you talk about best storylines, yeah, this goes, this goes to me, it ranks alongside that Greece 2004, you know, and mm-hmm. and 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 it's definitely one one for the memories. Of course, that is another underdog story on on its own, you know. But uh, I, I I would say, yeah, Denmark's one is definitely up there. There's, I mean, you 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 can't you. Can't basically top this lah. From how they they basically entered the competition, basically, uh, I would say uninvited. You know, they were they were, they were on their holidays. Yeah, correct, correct. These guys were <laughs> these guys were on their holidays. So you can just imagine, you know, just getting called up at the very last minute, uh, knocking stuff up, and basically coming out with the tournament. And it's just wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. I think I echo to you what you say. You know, I think. You, we used we used to see like you know the underdog teams usually beat beat a t- big team you know maybe in the group stage or even maybe you can push it maybe up to even a semi final or even even a quarter final but to win a tournament underdog I think they actually I'm not sure about your guys memory for me I think I feel this Denmark is the first team ever to kick start of this kind of fairy tale uh, victory and to win the team all the way there is it or but it's a remarkable journey actually isn't it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean yeah. in my lifetime, I would say I can only think of three situation. Of course, Denmark '92, uh, Greece '2004, and of course Iraq '2007 in the Asian Cup. Mm-hmm. This is the only you know so called like fairy tale run which went all the way. Yeah, but I think Denmark kicked off this 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 kind of winning the tournament. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, definitely, you can say that. I mean, mm. undoubtedly one of the best storyline. And in case if any one of you out there. Don't, didn't know about this. There is a movie on this. Yes, it's on Netflix. It's called uh, I think Summer of '92. Summer of '92, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Should, it's a very it's a wonderful should, movie. So you guys, you guys should be able to watch it. Yep. Yeah, should check it out. And and you know, talking about Denmark, Siva, you know why? Why was their head coach uh, Richard Muller Nielsen not considered a popular figure when he got the job? Well, to understand that context, you need to go back to the 1980s. Uh, if you all remember, or maybe you have read something about football in the 80s. There was this popular team called the Danish Dynamite, the, the era of the Michael Ladrov, Preben Elja, Jesper yeah, yeah. Olsen, and all that great players. And okay. you know they they didn't win things, but what they did was they played a brand of football that was so entertaining. So, I mean, it was ahead of its time. Perhaps what we are seeing today with uh, you know high pressing football, tiki taka, and all that, they were doing it back then. Was so, it 1986 World Cup? 1986 World Cup, yes, uh, but they they were, they were also there in uh, Euro '84. So okay. between so in that whole '80s, uh, basically Denmark th- they were one of the most uh, outstanding national team to watch. Had a, a you know, and it's the the way they played in in a way represented the psyche of the Denmark people itself, which is you know all about having fun, having a good time, no stress, no no pressure or nothing. 
But here's the sad part of it. They couldn't convert that into winning tournaments. You know, when it really mattered, they just seemed to falter. I think the example, as you just mentioned, Russ, the 1986 World Cup, what happened against Spain. Mm. So Richard Moller Nielsen, he was the assistant coach to the German coach of that era called Sepp Portiak. And he understood what was lacking in the Danish team. Perhaps a little bit of pragmatic was needed to make the team better so they can win things. But it didn't go down well with many within the Danish FA whom felt that you know they needed to you know get another German coach to continue the good work that was done by Pointek. Um, but of course, you know, against all odds, he he stick to what he believed, and you know, history will remember him as the coach that won something for Denmark even until to this day. But there's always going to be this debate in Denmark, in when it comes to Danish football, for that matter, which is the better side, whether the 80s or that 92 team. You know, personally for me. I tend to lean more towards the 80s because of their brand of football, but I won't take away anything from that 92 side because in the end of the day, title speaks for itself. But also, I think it's strange also because you know, historically, they might, they shouldn't even, should be even be there actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, Only Yugoslavia never came on. I think they would be, actually Yugoslavia would be playing on behalf of Denmark. Well, right? actually guys, you know, there's a little bit twist to this story, which I just found out last week while doing some research. The whole thing about the team was on holiday was not quite actually true, to be in fact. They were on the planning on the verge of going for a holiday. But what happened was at the time when Denmark was given the call to come and join the Euro, Euro 92, they were actually preparing for a friendly against CIS. There was actually oh. a, pre, a, pre, uh, a pre-tournament friendly between them and CIS. So basically, the squad was somewhat or rather there already. Mm-hmm. Just they, they, for them, it was like, okay, after we play this friendly, uh, off we go. We're going to enjoy our summer. <laughs> they just didn't realize that, you know, no, no, you guys are not mm. going anywhere just yet. <laughs> you know, there's something, you guys have an assignment for this coming summer. <laughs> wow, very, very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, so basically, uh, this indeed brings us uh, to the end of our Euro 92 segment, you know, and congratulations to Denmark for, for winning it and really giving us a story um, that, that, will, that we'll always remember until today. So when we come back, we'll be back with Euro 96. Stay tuned. To set it up initially for somebody else, then he had the shot, and the goalkeeper can't keep it out, and Germany have won it. The golden goal, game over. Bierhoff, a sensational substitute. Now we'll get into Euro '96. So you know, uh, Steven. You know, for, for England, the timing of the Euro was perfect in many ways. Yeah, you know, a new generation of players coming through, cultural significance. And of course, you know, this is definitely something you, you can talk on for hours. You know, British pop music, British pop, <laughs> on the rise, hey, many yeah. more. And in fact, and in fact <laughs> hey, <laughs> much more than that. Okay, and, uh, and, and in fact, you know, Stephen, it was through music that we got to know each other as well. So, so why do you think, you know, all, all this really played a part? Well, you know, uh, by 1996, you know, the English Premier League was already like going to its, uh, you know, fourth or fifth season, if I'm not mistaken. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's already showing its potential of being one of the best leagues in Europe. Uh, it, it was able to sign players like, you know, the summer before that, they managed to get Dennis Burkham, they managed to get Ruth Gullit. And, you know, it was the potential of the league was growing. And it was coincide with this thing called uh, Cool Britannia. Uh, cool Britannia was a term that came out at that era because suddenly, you know, British music became fashionable again. You have groups like Oasis, Blur, Radiohead, yeah. and Spice Girls and all that, and, you know, and, and James Bond has a new movie called Golden Eye. You know, so, you know, culturally, British, uh, you know, pop culture was coming back, you know, becoming, uh, you know, coming back to full swing again, you know, sort of reminded what it was in the 1960s. So it was just a perfect timing to have a Euro played in England, just as how it was perfect to have a World Cup in 1966. Yeah. Actually, talking about Euro 96, earlier on, um, Bala was talking about UPSR for Euro 92. Mm. Yep. Euro 96, I was sitting for my equivalent of UPSR here called the PSLE. Singapore's UPSR. Yeah, so so listeners would know what's the difference between our ages now. I'm the baby. <laughs> at, least, at least your government, uh, you know, ma- managed to you know save you for another four years, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. 
you know, of course, Ras, you know, in this uh, particular Euro, Italy did qualify. Yeah. And just before we get into that further, this was the first Euro which we had 16 teams. Prior to this, it was eight teams. So, you know, that's uh, it's a big difference. That's why in this particular Euro, we had all the big guns qualifying for, for, for uh, 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 a major European championship. And Italy was joint favourites alongside Germany on the pre-tournament. But they didn't make it past the group stage. I mean, what happened, bro? Very simple. No Baggio. No Baggio <laughs> equals no party. <laughs> okay, jokes, jokes aside, Italy still had a good team, a very, very good team because um, just not good enough to qualify out of the group stage because there's this thing about Italian football. When they are favourites, they tend to not do well. So they do well when they are not favourites and nobody gives them a chance. This is the mentality around Italian football. So um, anyways, this was the first major uh, sorry first euros that i watch from from the start and uh, i think they paid the price for underestimating Czech republic in the second game they won the first game against russia was quite comfortable but although the scoreline didn't reflect that but it was still quite comfortable second game arigo saki changed the team i think they underestimated Czech republic we got a shock defeat and we go into the third game against germany strong team needing to beat them we could have beaten them Zola missed the penalty. So despite Germany going down to 10 men, we still couldn't get a goal. And that's it. We are out of the tournament. And, uh, you know, Italy also tra- traditionally like to start the tournament slow, like how it happened in USA 94. Before that, they started the tournament slow and then they build up as the tournament went by. But because in the Euros, only the top two qualified, they couldn't afford to start slow and go through as one of the third three Oh, sorry, one of the best third place Finnish teams. So that's the reason why Italy was out. Too much tinkering from Arigo Saki. Mm. Uh, so, so I also want to say add on certain things because when I was, uh, this was the first time I was involved in Euros uh, because I started watching World Cup and NBA with my favorite Batista Argentina. And of course, I have, I have some uh, soft spot with Italy. In fact, Italy is my second uh, favorite team. So in Euros, I was following up with the Italy squad. I think this problem with Sachi, I think he's the one that actually surprised me because he brought AC Milan to one level. Mm. In fact, the brand of football he plays totally different than any typically Italian manager. But I think he is the, uh, I would say, uh, I don't know, banana skin or whatever is it. I think he, I think for me, he's a downfall for the Euro because one thing he left out Baggio. But also don't forget he left out Signori. And he would yeah. really, I mean, that's, that's, that's really three top stars. And the teamwork with him is totally different. And then the main reason why they actually went to the World Cup final in 1994 is because of Baggio's uh, rise to the second half of the tournament. But also not to forget that the final when Baggio went out, st- t- tactically, strategically, he could never be never any different. So if you ask me, I think this, 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 this Euro was down to Versace. Besides that, I don't think any other reason to it. He couldn't, he couldn't develop a, a squad with full of talent and uh, full of team with uh, incredible players. Yeah, until this era, I didn't dominate any team, but I think it's surprising. Maybe Asachi yeah. think too much and he wanted to deploy the same tactic to Italy. I'm not sure. I think he, he took two things, too many things wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he got that spot on because he's, he's known to be a bit of an obsessive coach. Something like what we see now with Pep Guardiola. Very, you know, obsessive and almost maniacal. So, yeah, yeah. Saki is known to be that. I think probably like what you say, overthinking. I remember he played Del Piero in the first game against uh, Russia. He played him on the left wing when he's not a left winger. And yeah. he only lasted 45 minutes. That's it. And we didn't see Del Piero for the rest of the tournament. Uh, but, then, but then, the idea basically, you see, when you talk about Pep Guardiola is attacking, fine. But, mm. you know, I mean, let's talk about national team, you know, like uh, Greece was a defensive team. Germany is a founding team. I think even Portugal recently they won by, you know, resilience and uh, and uh, determination by only Cristiano Ronaldo and with the whole squad. But Italy, I think all the way they never had, never had any identity. Even his tournament, suddenly they play good, suddenly they play cold. I think Sachi didn't didn't, didn't gel the team properly. Mm, yeah, true. I mean, okay, uh, moving on. Italy. I mean, totally agree with you guys. I mean, uh, you know, I think Roberto Baggio at that time, he was still in his prime, to be honest. Yeah, and yeah. I think he should have been there. It's just surprised why he didn't. And speaking of Baggio, of course, you know, there's a movie on him on Netflix. Do check yep. it out. And the interesting thing about what Sachi mentioned to him is that you are like Diego Maradona. You, you are to us as how Maradona is to Argentina. But surprisingly, you didn't allow Baggio to be the Maradona for Italy. You didn't let him lose 
otherwise you know it could have been a different story i mean who knows right yeah but anyway okay now let's talk about england they had a marvelous tournament i mean elwin the gascoigne goal yeah i mean uh, you 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 can you can get anything better than that gascoigne goal and, right and, against... and then and then the result against netherlands i mean hmm. they i totally believe that this could have been england's tournament for the taking i mean what do you think yeah i mean too. Yeah, uh basically yes, the 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 team basically had a lot of potential. You know, for me personally, you know, it was <clears throat> it was this was one of the most iconic euro for me because you know, one thing is growing up as a Man United fan, you know, and uh, getting exposed to English football and of course for me uh, what what I really liked about this euro was because of the Wembley stadium. You know, when every time when I watched that FA, uh, FA Cup matches, right? with that road to wembley song and all that you know it really brings back that 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 memories and and i can remember my first wembley memory right is when i saw gaza score that thunderbolt free kick against oh, yeah. uh, arsenal you know in yeah. the semis in 1991 i i i remember that goal very well and that's when i know wow gaza you know i got i got a shock of my life and indeed paul gascoigne was one of the main the pivotal figure in this team you know in this english team and uh, with the deadly partnership of Sheringham and Shearer you know and Shearer of course you know finished top scorer with five goals and Sheringham supporting him there most of the time uh, the midfield also you had Platt Paul Ince you know and then uh, of course Gaza is there as well and then McManaman and Anderton playing on the right you know they keep changing among each other so it 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 was a very good team and uh, you know talk about defense they got Tony Adams as a rock you know and of course you know the mustache man seaman in goal you know i mean basically <laughs> basically if you think about it right this english team had almost everything right but unfortunately you know it had to come on the penalties again right and uh, what what a worse opponent in this planet of, of all the teams germany of all yeah <laughs> of all the teams you know you 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 have to go against the mighty germans right yeah i remember i mean i was sitting uh, During form four, we we I bet against you for uh, what do you call it, England Germany, and you, you took England of being host. But thank God, I Germany won the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 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 you know you know for me, uh, uh, this in this English team, right? There there is actually a, I I would say a very sentimental moment for me is uh, is Stuart Pearce. You know, mm-hmm. when 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 Stuart Pearce scored that penalty against Spain, right in the quarters, that that really redeemed himself. You know, after the 1990 miss, right? And, yes, and, yes. And 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 indeed, you must see. I mean, you guys should check out the way, and even our listeners. How when when Pearce scored that penalty against uh, Spain, you look at the way he celebrated. He's like he finally got that monkey out of his back. You know that yeah, that psycho, thing that people the psycho. Can, yes, and they call him psycho psycho steward. Yeah, so it was really you know that 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 that. that Uh, the determination from him, and you know, give him credit again. He did score against uh, Germany as well. You know, unfortunately, uh, England's current manager yeah. Gareth Southgate missed the penalty. Right? So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So basically, yeah, the English team had huge potential. Yep. Just unfulfilled. Yeah. I, mean, I think leading leading up to that tournament, remember England got into a bit of trouble when they went on the pre-season. Pre-tournament tour to Hong, Hong Kong. Kong or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The players were caught drinking. Biasa, you know, England players, England and drinking mm. goes hand in hand. So they got got into a bit of trouble there, and then I I think the camaraderie and the team spirit there was strong. Yeah, the, the England team didn't have many Manchester United players by the way. Elvin, you only had yeah, uh, the two the two Neville Neville brothers. Yeah, the two so no backup, no scores. Yeah. All these guys are was their first season playing. We won the double that season, but they never made it into the England squad because they were tender age of twenty one only. 20, yeah, correct. 22, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, the Spice Boys. Uh, yeah, yeah. Spice Boys <laughs> were Liverpool players. They were there. <laughs> but if you kind of think about it, even the Spice Boys. I mean, I think only Steve McManaman, I would say, had a decent career with England. The rest, like Fowler, Ragnar, and all that. I, I don't think they. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Owen came in later, but at that particular era, only Mecca was the player that really had, you know, a, a, an impact with England. Yeah, true. But as for me, well, you know, um, I'm one quarter Scotch, so when England played Scotland, of course, you know, I think Shearer scored a goal first, and I believe there was a penalty for Scotland. Yeah, Gary yeah, McAllister. Gary McAllister missed it, and right in the attack, you know, that goal happened. I froze in front of the TV, thinking like, "What yeah. on earth was that?" <laughs> <laughs> But you know, when that kind of goal happens, you know, you know what they say. There's certain kind of goal that when it happens, your team cannot just lose. 
Like when Maradona scored that second goal against England, it's impossible for Argentina to lose that game. And same thing goes for this game. When that goal, Gascoigne scored that, I just knew it is England's game for the taking. There's no way Scotland can come back from this. And speaking of another goal, which again, you know, it's one of those goals that when you know when someone scores a goal like this, your team is is practically going to go out. It's none other than Czech Republic's Karel Proboski's goal against oh. Portugal. That Portugal's golden generation. I mean, what a disappointing that rush for them to go out prematurely in the quarterfinals when you think of the players they had, Figo, Rui Costa, Jao Pinto and all that. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Actually, I didn't know much of that Portugal team and that this was called the golden generation until afterwards. But um, I was intrigued by them because I've never seen them in any of the tournaments since I became a fan. And I knew a handful of the players there, especially those that played in Serie A, like uh, Rui Costa, Paula Sosa, Fernando Couto, and of course, you know, Luis Figo, big name Barcelona, Vito Baia in gold, Jao and Sa Pinto. Those two guys stand out because of their similar surnames. So, yeah, that, that was the Portuguese team. I expected them to do better because, you know, again, still we're not really taking the checks seriously. So when they played the checks, I thought uh, Portugal would beat them. But I was surprised when they got knocked out. And also, of course, there was still some resentment against the checks lah, for, as an Italy fan because, you know, I want to get, I want them out of the tournament. But uh, well done to the checks. They did well. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, Russ. I think also to add on your thing, the golden generation is team because the Portuguese has won the two uh, FIFA World Youth World Cup. So I think mm. the team was incredibly was in a good performance with all the big clubs, especially in Syria team. And, but then, yeah, they just couldn't uh, what have that age. And of course, uh, the Czech uh, got checkmate, like basically. Yes. Karol yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boboski and his uh, Robert Plan hairstyle as well. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, and 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 of course, you know that that's when he left his mark. That's when everybody knew Karel Poboski lah, huh? that goal. Mm-hmm. And then yes, uh, right, uh, right, right, right after that, the next season, uh, I mean, Emu for right? yeah, Emu for signed him. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, of course, Czech Republic became the, the Cinderella team of this competition. Of course, they did they couldn't do what Denmark did four years earlier, but you know, they really left a a very very important mark in this Euro guys. So. You know, like you mentioned, Karel Proboski, and let's not mm-hmm. talk, let's not forget Patrick Berger. This was yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, overall, I would say on paper, this Czech Republic team had quality overall, but uh, unfortunately, again, you know, when you play against Germany, I mean, I think I think Germany didn't want to repeat another Euro '92 2.0. <laughs> having lost against Denmark and then losing against yeah. the Czech Republic. <laughs> they didn't want to become the team that gives birth to Cinderella stories. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct, correct. And of course, in that German team, there was one glaring figure, I would say. Lah. I mean, you look at him, you know it's him. You, you, you can't go wrong. Yeah. It's Matthias Semmer. Of course, he won the yeah. best player of the tournament. So, voila, you know, you think this is justified? I mean, considering Scherer scored five goals, you had Devo Sucker at outstanding tournament, Zidane, Figo, so many other great names. I think uh, Zidane, I think the time was uh, still in Bordeaux and he's, I think it's one of the tournaments just before he went to turn up with Juve. Uh, so from, from that perspective, I feel that uh, he is by bringing France to the, the next level. But I think Scherer and Semmer had a good tournament, to be fair. And especially uh, Matthias Semmer, I think, he, of course, they won the Euro. So I think Justify, especially come as a liberal the uh, likes like how Germany used to play with the liberal, liberal style. I think it suited their style and the with this leadership and his format in the midfield and even the defensive. I think I, I think there's no other people despite it's all his attacking fellas, you know, Shara, Deva Sukar, Sidan, Figo. I think Samuel put them in their place. And uh, I think yeah, he's he's he deserves it. I think maybe you first agree or not agree, I don't know. He was fantastic. I think Samuel was fantastic. That tournament, the last great sweeper. Yeah. The it's all he's seen. Yeah. Even now, I'm having a, what this Ferrari with all the attacking players winning year after year. You know, it's, I think that Samuel, you know, Kanawaro, this first mm. of winning actually gives me happiness because seeing this first finally winning, you know, yeah, yeah. the hard work and scorer score the goal. And maybe Zidane just do a one one shot, a magical I, moment, and he gets the tournament, he gets the player. I don't believe that. Yeah. 
Yeah, but 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 you don't get this kind of salmon players anymore already, right? Yeah, I think no. I think after that was uh, if, if you could if you could remember was Lucio that that was another player that usually used to take off <laughs> take off on <laughs> take off on some unstoppable runs. Okay, yeah. but but coming back to this tournament, uh, Devo Suka was um, I mean, uh, is finishing. Yeah, right. I think Devo Suka is one one fella, right? Like. Uh, if you give him a one-on-one with a goalkeeper, very close, his footwork is just awesome, lah. Like that, that, yeah. that, that, that. I think if I'm not mistaken, that goal against Germany, the way he just pulled the ball to the, you know, from one feet to another, and then he scored was just, yeah, it's just fantastic. And then, and then. Was that France '98? No, I, I know. I think it's this, this, this tournament, bro. Yeah. And then of course, you know, of course, that goal against uh, Denmark as well. You know when he oh, basically, yeah, Michael, yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, he 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 to me is one uh, very underrated finisher in front of goal. Yeah, a very good number nine. Yeah, deadly. But yes. then you know, even is even my favorite player, Basu Justa. I don't deny that. But talking about all his position, uh, every, mm. you can see the striker position and you see the goalkeeper position. Only when the ball comes to that that side of the field, this first get uh, the action starts. For example, when the goal, when the when the ball comes to the goal, what the D line, the goalkeeper started, started getting in action, or the ball come to the striker side, which is I think maybe just uh, 35 meter uh, perhaps after that, the what the play has been striker side get excited, but the defenders and the midfielders actually the one who do the work all the way, you know, mm-hmm. go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, they play mm-hmm. offside, and yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of activities going like this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, and I think Matthias Samuel is the one player I think in in many ways uh, I would say benefited the most from a unified Germany because you have to remember, guys, he was a East, former East German. Yeah, East star, German, yeah. right? Yeah. And the fact that yeah. with the unified Germany, with his talent, he was able to play alongside you know your your Klinsmann, uh, what they call it, uh, Thomas Bertol, Thomas Hessler, Jürgen Kohler, all these players around him. He was able to accelerate his career and able to win something on the international stage, which may not have happened if East Germany was still around. Don't you guys mm. think? Yeah, true. Agree. Yeah. Okay. So, having said that, of course, the final. It this was the first time ever a final was decided by the golden goal rule. And I don't know, Elvin. For me, do you think it's the <laughs> most anti-climax? Yeah. Way? I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of this golden goal or silver goal or whatever you call it, lah. I'm glad they. I'm glad they got away with it. But at that yeah. time. I mean, I mean, what's your take on this? I mean, okay, to 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 sum it up, you know, in our local language, uh, Malay, we we call something potong steam. Okay, so basically, <laughs> <laughs> so, so so I mean, this this that that Oliver Bierhoff goal. I mean, it's not just that it was a golden goal. Okay, it being a golden goal is really uh one. It, it really like sucked the gas out of the whole atmosphere. Okay, but but the way the goal was scored. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, it wasn't like some fantastic belter or something like that, you know. It was like I don't know. The guy shot the ball, and then the keeper's hands were soft, and he just went fumbled through. Fumbled it. Yeah. Yes, he fumbled it, and then he just went in right, and like the whole tournament just ended keep, like that. Keep, keep you know? was Peter Kuba, right? Yeah, yeah, Peter Kuba. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. Ludek, not Ludek Miklosko or no, Pelos, no, no, it's Peter, Pelos Kinishek, well, right? Was, no, no. was better Kuba, yeah. Okay, okay. You know, and and of course, at, at, in that tournament, in that final, you know, I was rooting for the underdog, you know, and I was, you know, yeah. and uh, when Patrick Berger blasted in that penalty, we, you know, half an hour ago, I thought, okay, lah, you know, we are up, looks like we are in for an upset and all that, lah, you know. But then, you know, here comes Oliver Bierhoff, lah, and this is where he really introduced himself, you know, and uh, with all kinds of lessons in heading. You know when he headed the equalizer, and I think down the road everybody will know Hollywood will be off for what kind of headers he has contributed lah to the world mm. of football. Yeah. So I mean, in I mean, I I I never agreed to this golden goal thing lah. I I I didn't like it. Mm. Okay, yeah. Elvin, I give you a scenario. Huh? Just imagine. You're gonna you're gonna give me for a team I support, right? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, forget about team I support. Okay. Just, just imagine this in World Cup, I think golden rule. Maradona dribbled ten pass play and scored a winning goal in the Golden Ball. Is it is it justifiable? <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I'm saying, lad. Eh? If you're that. a supporter, if you're a fan, you'll take it, lah. But then in general, if you're neutral and all that, I think the best way to describe that goal would hmm. be that it was frozen in time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, eh, uh, I mean, any 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 other interesting takes you guys from this Euro that you guys want to share? Maybe you know from personal experience or something. No, I think we've we've 
shared our personal experiences as well of this Euro. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a lot of sweet memories. I think more of this Euros than Euro '92. Yep. But uh, yeah, this was a start probably of probably all of us. In fact, our journey with the Euros. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Because because for 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 me, uh, you know, it, it, this was like the I, I would say it was coming towards the end of our high school, right? So, uh, you know, there were there were lots of uh. uh Lots of constructive uh, <laughs> conversations, you know, and then lots of discussions, heated discussions going on, <laughs> you know, among our classmates, you know, and you know, we got guys, you know, I think, you know, I give, I'd like to give uh, one of our friends, Sri Ganesh, a shout out here yeah, because oh, yeah. this was when he really <laughs> went to the Czech Republic, yeah, he really, you know, went like a mission gun for Czech Republic. So, really, I mean, uh, this, 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 I mean, this, this was the memories like they left behind for me. Like, this, Don't forget this, that. The- Bola Dadu. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can explain to people what's the Bola Dadu. Uh, take an eraser. No, no, I think we bought a, <laughs> we bought a book. Uh, I think you know that time. I think, I'm not sure. 80 cents or one dollar. A mathematic book. Ah, uh, mathematic book. So what do we do? We do a group stage, a uh, knockout system. So each, or I think a four hours means uh, me. <laughs> Sri Ganesh and one more Najib, right? Najib, yeah. It was a mini tournament. Yeah, a mini tournament, but not one tournament. So each, uh, <laughs> we have maybe a five, six tournament. Uh, so what we do, we, we select, maybe like I take uh, the Germany, uh, then I take four teams like Germany or Italy or something like that. Then I'll even take another team. So we do a group stage, then we do a knockout stage, then we go to the final and then we need. So how he does it, we use Dadu, you know, you know what you call it, dice. Dice, yeah. So we, and and to be confirmed, we never buy a dice. We take a rubber. Uh, you know, we take. We use all our physics understanding, mathematics understanding. <laughs> we cut the rubber, and we put number one, number two, number three. And play that. So I think, yeah, yeah I think paper cuts the rubber. You know? <laughs> yeah. So 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 that that was a memory, lah. Yeah. Okay, and okay. and uh, you know, in yeah. So so basically, yeah, lah. See, these these are the memories we take away, lah. From okay. This yeah. Okay, I'm sure a lot of our millennials listeners here will be will be keen to explore more on this bola dadu as they hear Bala's description and probably they will go and you know try to recreate something of their own. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah, uh, and, yeah, yeah even so, so yeah, so so maybe let's let's uh, let's move on and let's talk about some other you know interesting stuff you know mm-hmm. that 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 came out of all this Euro tournament and all that. So you know. For for Sivan, you know, could do you think uh, unified Yugoslavia, you know, featuring players from Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia, Slovenia, Bosnia, all from that era, could actually win one of these Euros? I, I absolutely think they could have won it. I totally believe in it because if you think about the group of players, like mm. for example, like Serbia, you had Sinisa Mialovic, you had Vladimir Jugovic, you had Pedrak Mijatovic, and then Croatia, you had your Suka, your Boban, your Prosineski, your Robert Jani, and all that. Macedonia mm-hmm. had Darko Pancev and then uh, the Slovenia had Zlatko Zahovic and all these players. You Can you imagine what it would be like if they all were together as that Yugoslavia team? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, I think not only Euros, I even World Cup. I mean, if yeah. you could actually get them unified. Right? I, mean, I mean, you just yeah. need to look at it this way. You had Red Star Belgrade, they won the Euro European Cup in 91. That itself un- unlocked a lot of potential that what Yugoslavia football had, then, had back then. Yeah, and it's just unfortunately, you know, that the the politics, the civil war in the country split everything apart. And you know, on the eve of Euro '92, uh, they were pretty kicked out of the tournament, and Denmark came in. The rest is history. But I like to think that you know, if they were kept together, if that whole nation was together as Yugoslavia, I believe they could have won something. Because you know, I remember reading something about Yugoslavia in the 1990 World Cup. People say they were the Brazilian of Europe. Oh, and, mm, I mean, at that point of time. So, and in, to put it even better context, let's talk about France 98. Croatia was this close to going to the final and could have yeah. won the World Cup. Yeah. Imagine if that Croatia team could have had some of the Yugoslavia players who were mm-hmm. knocked out in the second round by the Netherlands. Netherlands needed a last-minute goal from Edgar Davids to, to, to be out of the tournament. So you can actually see what was lacking in the Croatia team if they could just, you know, bits and pieces puzzle here and there. You know, who knows what could have happened. Uh, but you know, these are just all the many what ifs in football. But I'm sometimes when I, you know, when I think about it, I feel like, man, you know, we, we really lost that a moment in time that we could have en- enjoyed watching these nations together. But you know, that's 
pretty much the way it is. Politics prevail, and you know, history it, it is what it is. So, yeah. I mean, I don't, what's what's your take, guys? Yeah, I think I completely agree with you. They they are quite a devastating team. There are a lot of talented players. I would want to name one more guy: Dejan Savic. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I've seen and yeah. I, have to, I have to name another guy because I forgot about his name. He was the number ten, Dragan Stoshkovic. Oh yeah. So so there you go. You know, just just keep keep naming keep naming these guys, and you can form a you know a, a whole squad of 23 already there for this whole tournament. Yeah, yeah you could you yeah. could definitely. Okay. So you know, let's uh, let's end this uh, episode. You know, talking, going something a little bit fun, guys. So you know, the '90s when it comes to jersey, I'm sure we can all agree. For me personally, they had some of the best jerseys of that era. Mm-hmm. Colorful, very extravagant. You know, you represented the whole '90s vibe. What was all about? So, mm. do you guys any have particular preference or favorite jersey from one of these Euros, especially like '92 and '96? I'd like to start first. The Czech Republic jersey team was awesome. Okay. Uh, mm. You like the Czech Republic of '96, huh? Yes. Yeah. Mm, okay. For me, uh, I, I I would say uh, the jersey that Peter Schmeichel wore in the final. That oh. rain that rainbow jersey. Yeah. That, that yeah. rainbow goal. That rainbow goalkeeper jersey is something you know. That's a collector. That's a collector item. Yeah. I I, right. I, I, I like that a lot, and I actually like the Italy '96. That, mm. that 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 Italy jersey actually looked very nice because he had that gold trimming uh, on the sleeve and the collar. I I I I like that Italy jersey of '96. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Correct. You named two of my choices as well. Oh really? <laughs> you also <laughs> wanted the Michael one. Yeah. 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 I think um I think the Germany, Holland, and France ones in Euro '92 those were iconic jerseys. Mm-hmm. Um, Holland again in Euro '96. I think they Holland never goes wrong with their jerseys. You know, some somehow always very nice. Mm. Um, Steven, I, I think the jersey. color itself will, will, will burn you. Really. <laughs> Look at the color. You're you're already basically attracted to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Scotland's jersey. I think Scotland's jersey was nice as well. Steven, what do you think? Yeah, I mean. Uh... I mean, to me, it, it wasn't like voila, you know, outstanding or what. But you know, it did had all the criteria. What was necessary for a, for a good Scotland jersey? Yeah, all the tartan and all that on jersey, mm. and England's jersey was good. But mm. I bet one jersey, guys. If it, I think if it's available on eBay or somewhere, it's going to fetch you guys a lot of money. The CIS jersey from Euro '92. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Correct. That, that that that's really one 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 for the museum, lah. Definitely, no 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 doubt about it. Your favorite player was playing in there, Elvin Kanchelskis. Yeah. Oh, Kanchel. Oh, yeah. Kanchelski was oh, correct. Yeah, he was a CIS player. Yeah, um, but it was, okay, but it okay. was, uh, yeah, not not a very good tournament for them. And uh, in in fact, guys, I think there's one more jersey worth mentioning. It's it's very simple, okay. But if you guys remember the Adidas design, uh, during that time, always had you know that Adidas. Uh, That three, that, that three stripes on both the both uh, the shoulders, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. left and the right yes, shoulder. Yes. But this one team only had it on one side, Sweden. If you oh. remember that Sweden, that Sweden jersey, the yellow with that blue stripes coming down mm. on the on on the on the right sleeve. Mm. And it continues on their pants on the left side, so it's like a flow there. Which, which I, 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 yeah, that Sweden jersey is something. Yeah, mm. and, okay, and okay. I think that's the same jersey they wore in USA '94. So, mm. yeah. For me, basically, uh, I think Italy was nice, but also not to forget England, the grey coloured jersey there. Jeez. Yes, yes. Oh, oh that uh, one. Yeah, <laughs> it reminds, it reminds me because I. Because that's the game that when the England actually lost to Germany, so I think after the MU first did the same thing. I felt lost half time. I think the game was just. Sweet, <laughs> <laughs> sweet, the great jersey. Yeah, I, think, I think that was the only time England had that jersey, right? Just for that tournament, right? Ah uh, yes, I can't recall after that any other. Yeah, yeah, I great. think I think so. I've not yeah, seen it again. Yeah, yeah, and th- and that was the only game they played that get that jersey, the the, mm. the semis. Yeah. yeah, and particularly I like the German jersey, the green color. Mm. Away jersey. Mm. Okay, mm. okay, all right. And what about the Spanish mm. jersey, guys? I mean, did they have that one particular design on the side of the? I think it's usually it's on the left side of the jersey. I, I remember back in the World Cup, so you know, World Cup '94, '90, and all that. They used to have the 
what kind of stripe on the side there? I'm not sure whether they had it for this Euro or not. Yeah, I think the 96 one, you, you mean the stripes that go all the way on the left side, is it? Correct, yes. Mm, yeah, the 96 one had, and, and, and the collar was quite uh, quite high as well, I think. If I, oh, if yeah, I, if Chinese I collar, I think. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Mm. And you can imagine like a fuller like Fernando Hierro, a very tall wearing that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it makes him look <laughs> taller. Uh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Miguel, Miguel Engel Nadal. Yeah. Yep. That yeah, was fierce. That guy was fierce. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. So, you know, we, we've done with favorite jersey. So, I'm going to ask all three of you guys if you guys have your best 11 from both Euros. I mean, you, just briefly explain your formation and the, the lineup of players. So, you want to go first, Russ? Okay. I've got it. 4 4 2. Mm-hmm. Classic 90s formation. 4 4 2. So, goalkeeper. One and only Peter Schmeichel. Mm-hmm. At right back, I've got Jocelyn Engloma from France. Mm, okay. Sweeper, I've got Matthias Semmer. Mm-hmm. And centre back, Jürgen Koller. So, oh, okay. German back line. Left back, Paolo Maldini. Mm, Can't okay. go wrong with him. All right. Right wing, Carol Poboski. Centre mid, Andres Muller. And Paul Gascoigne. Mm, okay, okay. Left wing, Patrick Berger. And up front, I'm going to go for this. This pairing, I feel, is the best pairing among the two uh, Euros, Alan Shearer and Teddy Sheringham. Alan Shearer and Teddy Sheringham. Okay, all right. Fair mm. enough, fair enough. How about mm. you, Elvin? Okay, for me, uh, I've got some, uh, some differences with Russ. I will go with a 3 5 2. Okay, oh. and I'll have okay, Schmeichel, I'll be, Schmeichel being goal for me. Okay. But among my three defenders, I'll, I will have Stefan Reuter on the right hand side with oh. Matthias Semmer. Okay, Matthias Semmer in the middle. And on the left, you know, due to that, that, that determination and all that sentimental thing, I'll put Stuart Pierce. Okay, uh-huh. I'll put Psycho on the left. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. And my, my, five, my five midfielders uh, will be Andy Moller, uh, Paul Gascoigne, Patrick Berger on the left. I will, I will switch Brian Laudrop and I'll play him on the right, attacking right side. Like a forward right attacking midfielder, right? And of course, you know, I can't, I mean, we have to include a, a, a Danish midfielder here and, you know, Kim Milford, I, I, I will put him in the middle of the park there. Okay. Mm, okay, among, okay. among the five uh, midfielders. And my, the two guys up front, I think to me, this, these guys will be deadly is uh, Alan Scherer and Jürgen Klinsmann. Oh, yeah, so I'll have, yeah I will, I'll have to put these two players up front. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they might be going for the same ball all the time. <laughs> uh, okay, Bala. Okay. I, I hope your goalkeeper is not Peter Schmeichel. Uh, I think I, I have to go Peter Schmeichel. Again. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I think he's our wall. I think in our era, especially as especially when the team losing, what you see now, uh, the Ellison again. I think Peter Schmeichel started over as well. Mm-hmm. So yes, Peter Schmeichel uh, for me is a goalkeeper. In defense, I put Sam, Meldini, Reuter, and Ferrara. Mm. Uh, I think this will give a solid backline uh, with the uh, minimum uh, attacking. But I've, I've familiar used the uh, tactical of the Germany attack because Sam was there. And then uh, in midfield, I use three. Uh, basically, I put Patrick Berger because I think he's had one of the great shots, especially I remember against Blackburn Rovers. And I think he's very good in far shot and also his crossing is quite good. Uh, perhaps they put two attacking midfielders to support him, maybe in terms of Moller and also Rui Costa. Mm. Basically, they were doing okay, all the assists okay. together, support. And then I, I have three striker. Basically, uh, Zola will be playing the, the hole to support, of course, the, I think, like Elbert Elvin said, the two of the daily striker of all time, Sharon and Klinsmann. Wow, okay, interesting, interesting. I mean, this thing, well, to be honest, guys, I don't really have a personal best 11 because uh, I, did, I didn't have time for it. But Somewhere along the line, I can see my personal eleven will have all the players that you guys have mentioned because you guys have more or less pretty much picked up the best from these two tournaments. I mean, you can't go wrong with Peter Schmeichel, that's for sure. No way. I I, I don't think you can ever find any other goalkeeper from these two Euro that I would say outstanding. Although I might give a shout out for Bodo Igner. Mm. I might give a shout out, say, for... Um, David Seaman. David. Well, maybe David Seaman. Why not? Why not? I mean, it's not like... Uh, I mean, it's not like he had a bad Euro in 96. It's just, unfortunately, like, penalty shootout, right? But he, he didn't yeah. do anything. He could, he didn't do anything wrong. He did what he possibly could. So, yeah. And you got, like you guys mentioned, striker, uh, Klinsmann and Scherer. I mean, I'm not too sure how you can maneuver from there. But maybe I might pick Devo Suker for that matter. Mm. Mm-hmm. Dennis Burkham had a good Euro 92 also. 
Well, I can't really remember. I mean, 90... yeah, yeah. I mean, 90... I mean that 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 Dennis Bergkamp of '92 was like the changing of guard, lah, from when Bastard to to Bergkamp. Mm. Like, yeah, like you can probably, see he was, probably. Yeah, he was coming into the 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 picture at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I don't forget, you know, in that '92 squad, Sweden, they had a very yes. interesting player yes. up front. The deadly two flers. Yes. Thomas <laughs> Brolin. Yes, Brolin and Dalin. Dalin yes. Yeah. And don't forget, their goalkeeper was outstanding as well. Oh, uh, the madman from Malmo. <laughs> Thomas Ravelli. Yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, it's more, more, aligned, more aligned with what you guys have chosen. I mean, these are wonderful Euros. Uh, I mean, for me personally, when I think of what Euro 92 and 96, it happened in the 90s. It happened perhaps uh, at the most carefree period of my life. Unlike what today, you know, it's a, a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different <laughs> level altogether. But back then, you know, it's still depending on your parents' pocket money, you know, you're <laughs> free, free to do anything beyond their radar, I would say, you know, as, as long as they're not keeping an eye on you, you're pretty much a free man. You can do anything in the world you want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it brings me a lot of great memories, like guys. I, I mean, how about you guys? Um, not so carefree because I was still in school. But uh, yeah, I was only 12 years old by the time Euro 96 was around. But yeah, I, I get what you mean. Um, well, it was wonderful days. I was in what do you call primary school here. I call it primary school. Skola Renda in Malaysia. So still a kid. Um, had some wonderful memories. I think you, you guys are talking about Bola Dadu. I'm not sure if you guys have played this where... Uh, you know, Bola you take the Bola <laughs> I, I don't know what you call it down there, but uh, we take the you know the cardboards. Yes, uh, and you yeah, yeah, them and pull it into half, and then and you roll a small uh, aluminium ball for aluminium wrapper, and then you keep the cigarette, the cigarette one, like that. <laughs> the cigarette ah, yeah, one. yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, we I used to take from the back of the full scale paper, so the oh, cardboards there, I would collect that. Mm. I'll make my own teams and we have our own mini tournaments during recess. Correct, correct, correct. And then you have, you have the your goal post is made out of paper. Paper, so. correct. Sampan, sampan, yeah. sampan. Yeah, yeah sampan, <laughs> yes, 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 correct. Mm. So that, had a, that was another memory from the, around Euro 96 time. Yep, mm. definitely. So yeah, those are the memories I had. Definitely. I mean, uh, this, this is an uh, interesting time. Jerseys were colorful, you know, it's very vibrant. I mean, I think it represented that particular era, I would say. Mm. Overall, what when you think of Euro 92, 96, and of course, in between the World Cups during that era. For me, basically, I met my best friend, Elvin. Uh, it's been years for what, 20 over years together. So after that, only for two, two years, I got to know Sivan. Uh, Mm-hmm. So thanks to all of you and to Sivan and Elvin and God you know Russ. So thank you for that also. But I was just like, Pleasure. like this is basically the friendship of journey for even the I think beginning of the Bola Bola. So I went back to Russ. So it was a very uh, nostalgic period and a lot of good memories. Yeah, like what Sivan said, you know, carefree, you know, it's, you own the world. And uh, yeah, I was involved in Sukma, Taekwondo. Well, yeah, a lot of a lot of excitement at the time. A lot of, the morning was something you look forward like the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 indeed like the 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 best days like and and, and you know also uh, call, uh buying that magazines that come out before yeah. the tournament and all that as well right yes uh, yes the yes magazines with the with the squad and all the analyses and all this but nowadays people don't don't get this stuff you know everything is available online they just go wiki and all that they just check right but yeah, last yeah. Time people collect Collect this 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 kind of memor- memorabilia. You see, so it, it's you know, it was no, during yeah, during yeah. that era lah. Before all the playstations and all these, you know, like what you guys were saying like You know, all the bola keto, bola dadu, all the basic stuff that made us the most happiest lah. The simplest things in life, mm-hmm. the most basic at that point of time. Yeah, and, and don't forget they used to do the sticker. I think from Panini, I think uh, you can buy and then yes, the yes. Your collection. Yeah, uh, true. Yeah, yeah. That was another era at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, the well, they still have the sticker, and of course, they did release uh, the Euro version. Unfortunately, it's not available in our Malaysian store, so you need to buy. You need to buy it online. No, I check out already. It's not stick. Uh, I'm not sure the sticker, but the card, you know, the Panini, the collector's card. Uh, the one you can mm-hmm. buy already, actually. I think you can get copy. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But uh, yeah, I can get that. maybe, mm. but not all this becoming a collector's item. Whereby you know. I'm not sure 20, 30 years from now, our podcast will go like, you know, rocket. <laughs> mm. True, true. 
Look for and, Mbappe. <laughs> and, and and guys, just just one more thing to add here is uh, it was like after Euro '96, in '96, then he come '97, '98, and all that. This was these are the things, right? That led us up to playing championship manager, right? I think I think we need to have another episode just on championship manager. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Definitely, definitely. Because that's when something when you click this check player, Jan Superpereg. Oh, playing for Strasbourg. Okay, I know the player Euro ninety six. Yes, yes. Yeah, something. Yeah, good, good memories, lah. Good memories. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, Ras, any last words from you? Yeah, just um, let the listeners know that this is part one of our Euro special. Yeah, part this is the first is, leg. First leg. Uh, first leg. Second leg. You become. I'll be hosting. Um, so we'll be covering the Euros in the northeast. So all 2000, 2004, 2008. So we'll be doing part two after mm. this episode, which is releasing sometime next week. Mm-hmm. Okay. So 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 good. Away goals rule rules are bro. <laughs> <laughs> like, I heard I heard I heard they were talking to scrap the, the away goal rule. Let's say maybe I may not. Sure. Really? Oh, okay. Uh, and also another thing also I just found out the facts. You know the back pass rule. Uh. The last tournament was held to having the back pass. Uh, it was 1992. Nine. Was it? Euro, yes. After that, they scrap off the. Okay, uh, I thought it was nineteen ninety was the last one. Ninety two. I mean, I, I mean, after the tournament ninety two, I think immediately was in. Uh, I think Olympics. They started to enforce the back pass rule. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Interesting fact. So, any last word from you guys, Elbin Nimbala? Uh, no, just a great episode, guys, and uh, thank you very much, Ras. You know, for for like joining join venture with us in this episode together. Yeah, uh, welcome, really welcome. Thank, thank, thank you for your time. So, you know, guys, do do check out Ras. Uh, you know, Ras podcast as well. You know, back pass with Ras and enjoy all those uh, those quality episodes that he has over there. Yeah. Yep. So do 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 support him. Yeah. No, okay. thanks for the shout out. Yeah. No worries, man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Ras, uh, for for joining us. Uh, it was it was a good good uh, good idea for talk about Euros. In fact, it brings us a lot of memories. And uh, yeah, I think it's good to know you as well. And then, uh, but but we should support uh, Backpal Ras. I think you also do a lot of writing as well for your in, in your face in your Facebook. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. True. Uh, we have a lot of other contents as well, not just the yeah. podcast. And so we we constantly sharing. On our Facebook page and Twitter page. Yeah, so a lot of writing as well, and good luck for writing about Antonio Conte leaving Inter. So good luck for that as well. Uh, I thought we we're gonna talk about that off air. <laughs> so I think there's a lot. I think two things in one MU, and also this good luck is having a wonderful time in it, guys. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Fr- friendly banter is going around here. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it was wonderful to talk to all of you guys, and of course, you know, we will. We will post the link of the back pass with Russ and including from their website and also all their social media handles. And so, yeah, do sure to check them out. And thank you, Russ, for joining us. Thank you, Elwin and Bala, for all the thank insights you. and input. Uh, yeah. And of course, this is episode one. We will look forward to and uh, look forward to our episode two, hosted by Back Pass with Russ. In the meantime, goodbye for now. Uh-huh.